Victoria Helen Macfarlane was born in Callender, Perthshire on the 25th of November 1897. Early on in life she terrified her school friends with her dire prophecies and hysterical behaviour. Her mother, a member of the Presbyterian Church, was mortified by her daughter's actions. After leaving school she worked at Dundee Royal Infirmary and in 1916 she married Henry Duncan. Henry would support his wife throughout all her controversy. She became a mother to six and worked a part-time job in a factory. In 1926 she started offering seances where she claimed to be a physical medium and was able to permit the spirits of recently deceased persons to materialise by emitting ectoplasm from her mouth. In 1928, the photographer Harvey Metcalf attended a series of seances at the house of Duncan. During a seance, he took various flash photographs of Duncan and her alleged materialisation of spirits, which included her spirit guide Peggy. The photographs would prove the spirits to be fraudulently produced, such as a doll made from papier-mâché draped in an old sheet. In 1931, the London Spiritualist Alliance, LSA, examined Duncan's method. An early examination of pieces of Duncan's ectoplasm revealed it was made from paper mixed with egg white, stuck together. Duncan's trick was to swallow and regurgitate some of her ectoplasm. The LSA persuaded her to swallow a tablet of methylene blue before one of her seances, and because of this, no ectoplasm appeared. The committee, in a report, concluded that the material was swallowed by Mrs Duncan at some time previous to the sitting and subsequently regurgitated by her for the purpose of exhibition. Harry Price, the world-renowned researcher of phenomenon, who was well known for debunking fraudulent spiritualists, paid Duncan £50 to perform a test seances, although he had already proved the ectoplasm to be cheesecloth and chemicals. In Price's own words, At the conclusion of the fourth seance, we led the medium to a settee and called for the apparatus. At the sight of it, the lady promptly went into a trance. She recovered, but refused to be x-rayed. Her husband went up to her and told her it was painless. She jumped up and gave him a smashing blow to the face which sent him reeling. Then she went for Dr William Brown who was present. He dodged the blow. Mrs Duncan, without the slightest warning, dashed out into the street, had an attack of hysteria and began to tear her seance garment to pieces. She clutched the railings and screamed and screamed. Her husband tried to pacify her. It was useless. I leave the reader to visualise the scene. A 17 stone woman clad in black sateen tights, locked to the railings, screaming at the top of her voice. A crowd collected and the police arrived. The medical men with us explained the position and prevented them from fetching the ambulance. We got her back into the laboratory and at once she demanded to be x-rayed. In reply, Dr William Brown turned to Mr Duncan and asked him to turn out his pockets. He refused and would not allow us to search him. There is no question that his wife had passed him the cheesecloth in the street. However, they gave us another seance and the control said we could cut off a piece of teleplasm when it appeared. The sight of half a dozen men, each with a pair of scissors, waiting for the word was amusing. It came and we all jumped. One of the doctors got hold of the stuff and secured a piece. The medium screamed and the rest of the teleplasm went down her throat. This time it wasn't cheesecloth. It proved to be paper soaked in egg white and folded into a flattened tube. 
Could anything be more infantile than a group of grown-up men wasting time, money and energy on the antics of a fat female crook? In a seance on the 6th of January 1933 in Edinburgh, it is alleged that the spirit of a little girl called Peggy emerged in the room. A sitter named Essam Moore grabbed her and the lights were turned on. The spirit was revealed to be made from a stockinette undervest. The police were called and Duncan was prosecuted and fined £10 for fraudulent activities. During World War II in November 1941, Duncan held a seance in Portsmouth at which she claimed the spirit materialisation of a sailor told her HMS Barham had been sunk. Because the sinking of HMS Barham was revealed in strict confidence only to the relatives of casualties and not announced to the public until late January 1942, the Navy started to take an interest in her activities. It would become clear some of the few relatives who knew of the sinking had contacted Duncan that's how she knew about HMS Barham. Two lieutenants were among her audience at a seance on the 14th of January 1944. One of these was a Lieutenant Worth, who was not impressed as the white cloth figure had appeared behind the curtains claiming to be his aunt, but he had no deceased aunt. In the same sitting, another figure appeared claiming to be his sister, but Worth replied his sister was alive and well. Worth was disgusted by the seance and reported it to the police. This was followed up on January the 19th when undercover policemen arrested her at another seance as a white shrouded manifestation appeared. This proved to be Duncan herself in a white cloth which she attempted to conceal when discovered. She was arrested on seven counts, two of conspiracy to contravene the Witchcraft Act, two of obtaining money by false pretenses, and three of the common law offence of public mischief. The authorities at the time were afraid that she would continue to reveal classified information at court, she was found guilty and sentenced to nine months in prison. She was one of the last people to be convicted under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. Duncan, even after vowing to never perform another seance, died at her home in Edinburgh on the 6th of December 1956, just after performing another seance. Spirit Talker session regarding Helen Duncan. The last case I was researching, I put the Spirit Talker on and asked a question, not expecting anything, and I got a reply very, very relevant to the case that I was talking about and was looking at. Then I didn't have my camera on. This time, I've got the camera on <clears throat> and Frank has just come on it. Hello Frank, I'm June. I would like to, if possible, speak to Helen Duncan. Si. Helen. You do realise that now your grandchildren are trying to have your name cleared. What do you think about that? Where are my ashes? I do have ashes here and they are in my bedroom. Is it possible for you to tell me who you are? Where 
we're all good. That's good to hear. Is there a name? Is it possible for a name? Religious. Helen, did you honestly think that you wouldn't be found out by anyone? Yes, I did. Oh, well, you really thought that? Well, it just seems to people that you thought that vulnerable people, people who are grieving, were being taken advantage of. Are you regretful of that, that you took advantage of these people? The manifestations that you claimed to be a loved one coming to visit the person that was there at the time were fake. Are you regretful of that? Maybe I should change that. Why did you do it? Did you think you were helping the grieving person? Or was it just for the money? Share my message. I'll share your message if I get one. What's the message? I've been watching you. No, I don't think you have. Did you think you were helping these people? Or was it just for the money? Anyway, let me know. She's here. Well, she's here. What's she got to say? Nothing. I do think, Helen, that your conviction shouldn't have happened. I don't think it was necessary. But what you did was wrong. Please. Personally, you took money off people who are grieving. You told people things that weren't true. Some people were probably felt better for it, but a lot of people were My not neck. happy. If you could say sorry, I'm sure you would. Your grandchildren are fighting to have your name cleared. Shall I make noise? Go on then. Nothing. Your grandchildren are trying to get your name cleared. You had an illness, Helen, for a long time, apparently. The irony of it was after vowing you wouldn't do. Children here. After vowing you wouldn't do any more seances, you went ahead and did another. And the irony being, you died not long after. You got anything to say, Helen? Because looking at the words that we've got down here now, there's only maybe a couple that would be relevant. Sister. I gave her the idea of vectorplasm, the cheesecloth. Where did that come from? Was that you or your husband or somebody else? What did you think of Harry Price? Did you like Harry Price? 14. Unexplained. Don't be afraid. I'm not. On the night of the 19th of January 1944, one of your seances was raided by police. Do you know why? Out. Help. 
Who needs help? Helen, have you got anything to say at all? Please say it into that little... Forest. <laughs> yeah, we've got a forest here. You won't know what this is. Great. <laughs> great. It is great. It's a phone. Not the sort of phones that you'll remember, but it's a phone. But you can talk into that and I can see your words. Little girl. Well, we were all little once, up. Okay, anybody here uh, that's been trying to get through, you need to go now. There's only loved ones allowed to stay. You're not allowed to attach to any of the equipment, anything in the home, or even to me. When I say goodbye, you need to go. Listen. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye.